in the School of Psychology, one of the biggest groups that uh, research groups is the developmental psychology research group. And in fact, it's one of the biggest um, developmental psychology research groups in the country. We study children from as soon after birth as we can get them into the department until they're through the school ages. Um, different things develop at different times, so there's always something interesting to, to look at. One of the interesting things I think about developmental research is that, especially when you're looking at babies, you've got to think of very new techniques because they can't tell you what, the, what they see or what they hear. So we have to find new ways of actually investigating that. Over the first few weeks, babies build up their social skills and by the time they're around seven, eight weeks old, they're very good communicators. So if a mother sits facing a baby and we simply ask her, can you just chat or play, play with your baby as you might at home? Something happens between them that looks like a two-way conversation. And although that's something that happens very naturally without any effort on the adult's part, what we as psychologists know is that kind of interaction is really quite important for the baby's development. I think we can enhance parents' capacity to respond to their infants in a way that will best promote their development. And if we can support parents in their awareness of the baby, then we can help them enjoy them and ideally promote the kind of parenting that will serve the baby's development well. There's two ways that we can look at development. We can look at typical development, so we can see how children um, change over time um, as they progress normally through development. We know that adults can have very large vocabularies, but how do babies learn their first words? and how does that influence the kinds of vocabularies they're going to have later on. Our research is interested in children's language development and in particular how they build a vocabulary. We're interested in this because of the size of the problem. Children have to learn a large number of words and also because it should be a difficult problem. How do you work out which thing in your environment every new word maps onto? So we carry out studies that look at a variety of techniques or strategies that children might use to solve this problem. Do they notice the co-variation of words with objects in their environment? Are they sensitive to the social cues provided in the word learning situation? Um, and what about children who can't use these types of cues when it goes wrong? Well, it's important to know how, w what mechanisms are at work in learning words. Uh, is there a specific part of the brain which is specialised for learning words? Or is learning words something that the brain naturally does when it encounters language? Because it, it, it's really crucially important to know, as we get, particularly as we get more and more into knowledge of the genome, whether the, the human genetic endowment is particularly geared for learning language in particular parts of the brain, or whether the brain is just ready to learn language and as long as we are nice to it, feed it language, it'll, it'll learn language. So the other aspect that we're looking at is atypical development. So here we're looking at children who fail to develop properly and that can be for lots of different reasons. So for instance we look at clinical um, problems such as anxiety and depression in children. We look at um, children with developmental disorders and we also look at children with genetic developmental disorders. Again there's two reasons that it, um, you might want to look at atypical development. One is that if you can see what processes go wrong in these children then you can identify the things that are important for typical development to occur. Well, anxiety disorders are the most common form of emotional problem in children, affecting around one in ten children. And it manifests itself in many different ways. For example, some children have um, separation anxiety disorder, where they have intense fears and apprehensions about being separated from, principally from a parent. Another manifestation of an anxiety problem would be social phobia or social anxiety disorder where children are so shy that they cannot even speak to people outside of their immediate families. And then another common form is um, termed generalised anxiety disorder and that's a condition characterised principally by intense worry where children will worry about many different things in their lives and beyond their lives. And one of the real problems with anxiety disorders in children is that if they're not treated successfully, then they tend to persist into adolescence and, and into adulthood. And in order to prevent disorders, you have to have an understanding 
of their development. And the fundamental research that we're doing is precisely concerned with that. We are looking at very early processes that operate within families which may contribute to children either um, becoming anxious or remaining anxious. And with a knowledge of the basic processes that are operating in this development, we should be able to um, develop treatments to prevent these disorders developing in the first place. So, as you'll have seen from this film, um, we do a range of research in the department that, re that starts from basic research looking at the processes of development through atypical development where we can see when the processes go wrong and see what the most important process is for a particular type of development through to developing interventions and strategies for children so that we can improve their quality of life.